The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, folks. Uh, just another minute or two here, and uh, we'll be getting started on our webinar today, Building CR Roadmaps for Nonprofits. Hi, folks. Uh, just the top of the hour here today, uh, we're going to give uh, folks a, a minute or two more to uh, get online. we uh, got a nice uh, attendance today, and we want to give everybody a chance to uh, get on board before we get started. I do want to uh, note that we are taking questions throughout the webinar today, so do uh, uh, familiarize yourself with the questions uh, feature, and um, we certainly want to hear from you throughout the uh, webinar today. So maybe take a moment to uh, locate that feature and, and get your questions ready. All right, we're going to get started here. Uh, welcome to our webinar today from Hello Consulting, Building CRM Roadmaps for Nonprofits. Uh, I am Keith Heller, and I'm joined today by Paul Matejevich uh, from Feeding America, who will be sharing some of his experiences a little bit later about uh, CRM Roadmaps. And um, I'm uh, really pleased to see uh, so many folks in attendance today, uh, some old friends and colleagues and clients and, and new folks as well. Uh, did want to point out to you, we are taking questions throughout the webinar today, so please do uh, uh, find and familiarize yourself with the uh, questions menu and um, fire those off as they occur to you. And uh, uh, my colleagues here will be uh, passing those along to me. Uh, and we'd like to have, as much as we can in a webinar, format a dialogue uh, rather than wait until the end for all the questions. Let's take those in context. So without further ado, uh, we'll get started here. Um, uh, we're going to be going over uh, the broad concepts of what is a CRR roadmap today, what are the key components of such a roadmap. We'll be going into some details in some areas. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of content uh, that we could uh, do uh, around this topic. We could, we could you know, keep you busy for a couple of days in a seminar. Um, but uh, obviously we have an hour here, and so uh, we'll be able to share a good amount of what we know and, and have experience, but also we're going to point to some resources that will allow you to go deeper. Um, so uh, with that, i uh, give you a little bit of an introduction to Heller Consulting. Uh, this is our 20th year. I started this company back in 1996 uh, working on DOS programs. So it's a lot of fun uh, uh, to be able to sh uh, share some of this experience here with you. Uh, we're located around the country. We're a boutique firm with 35 folks. And all of us, this is key, all of us uh, serve solely nonprofits. Uh, and we have all worked in nonprofits. And we really love the sector and are so excited uh, that we can, you know, be of service uh, to, to nonprofits. So we help nonprofits uh, in, in three key, uh, key areas, connecting your systems, your technologies, uh, your CRM systems, part of what we're going to talk about today, connecting your team. We also have a real big focus on operations and business processes, also change management, which is sort of the softer side of these kind of projects, but very key, and Paul's going to be helping uh, talk about that today a bit, and then connecting your organization with your constituents. Uh, ultimately, we are here for our constituents, those people who are the beneficiaries of our mission uh, and, and the services uh, or opportunities that we offer, and also connecting with our constituents to provide volunteer opportunities, to raise funds, et cetera. So all of these things are uh, uh, key and part of a CRM strategy. Our clients uh, have included just a, a wealth of wonderful organizations. You see some here. Uh, the earlier slide you might have noted, uh, we've had over 1,500 clients in our 20 years, over 3,000 projects. Uh, you'll notice twice as many projects as clients, and that's 
because we're we're uh, pleased to say that a lot of a lot of organizations once they look at this, once they come back again, that's a point of pride for us and, and a professional satisfaction. So as I noted, we're going to cover uh, this is a broad topic. Uh, we're going to cover uh, in in a good amount of detail some aspects of a CRM roadmap and the concepts and strategies around CRM and CRM systems. But if you want to go deeper, we love to share. Um, so we write uh, two or three white papers a year um, and a host of other resources. Uh, these are all located on our website, teamheller.com, slash resources. You'll see a selection here. CRM papers are a big picture, strategic concepts. Um, Salesforce is specific to that uh, product and platform, very, very powerful. Uh, and then uh, engagement with constituents. And this has a lot to do with uh, digital strategies and, and ways to really enliven uh, your constituent base, which is part of the reason one develops a CRM. So with this, you know, I'm tossing, tossing around the word CRM, CRM uh, you know, just to note in the uh, uh, nonprofit sector, but that means constituent relationship management. It's a uh, acronym that we have borrowed from the commercial sector where they call it customer relationship management. Uh, and what's interesting is in the nonprofit sector, constituent covers a lot more ground. Constituent includes not just those people who quote unquote consume your services, but also those who support uh, your organization through uh, donations as, as uh, donors, through advocacy, through volunteerism, uh, you know, some sort of stakeholder. So the CRM vision for nonprofit is a vision uh, that is meant to encompass all of these different groups uh, and bring them together, uh, you know, for the greater service of your organization and your mission. So, mostly when people think about all these different groups, they think about uh, their current situation in terms of uh, departments or databases or strategies. And this is this is where most of us are. We are siloed. Our uh, volunteers and our advocates and our beneficiaries and our fundraisers and our board members and our, uh, you know. Political advocates and all these, these people are all in different systems. They're all uh, uh, have we have different strategies to engage with them. One department doesn't know what the other department is doing, and this creates a real problem. This creates what we call the disconnected nonprofit. Um, and when you have people in all different departments and, and databases and, and strategies, uh, very often the same person is. Uh, communicated with by multiple aspects of your organization and quite often uh, within your organization those different departments don't realize they're doing that or realize well this might be happening but they don't know where they have overlap and, and which constituents are getting these different newsletters and emails and, and asks and such but I'll tell you there is one person who does know and it's unfortunate because that person is your constituent the constituents themselves are hearing from different aspects of your organization, uh, and uh, they're sometimes wondering, gosh, does the right hand and the left hand uh, know what's going on here? Um, and this, unfortunately, can lead to uh, an erosion of trust or missed opportunities or compromised communications. And so we really want to uh, take a step back as part of our CRM vision to rectify this and create a different experience for our constituents. Um, and so that starts with a constituent engagement strategy. We, we leave behind all of our different pieces of software and all of our different departments. We just thinking from the perspective of the constituent, what experience do we want them to have? And so we ask ourselves these questions. How do we want to relate to our experience, uh, to our constituents? How do, how, do they want, how do we want them to relate to each other? How do we want them to relate to us? What is it, what is, if someone was to ask our constituent, Gosh, what does it feel like to be, you know, in the fold, part of this organization, affiliated with this organization? We want them to crow about how wonderfully they feel treated, that, that our organization really understands them and gets them, and while there's multiple ways that they can be engaged in the organization, our organization really realizes how they want to engage, and then we do that, and we, we really message them and, and, and make them feel part of that. And then we also offer other opportunities that are related and make sense given who they are. But we want that really personal feeling and, and, you know, part of your CRM vision can be articulating, okay, what does that mean to my constituent right in front of us? To, to the folks who are most engaged with us, what's most important to them? Um, and ultimately, this comes down to a great question, how can we all do more together? Because 
your constituents are engaged with you because they care about your mission. They want to do more. And we want to give them those opportunities by crafting a CRM vision and aligning the rest of the organization around it. So once we've thought about you know, what that experience is going to be, then we can turn towards our technology and our operations and how we, uh, how we use our systems, how we work with other departments in our organization to align around putting that constituent at the center and giving them the best possible experience. All right, I have a question in here. Uh, to what extent have you seen CRM used in nonprofits to monitor services provided to beneficiaries and the impact of those services? So this is a great question. This is a really, um, this has been for the last several years uh, a burgeoning, uh, growing movement uh, with outcomes measurement. Um, how can we know how we're doing with our constituents? And CRM systems are increasingly providing the opportunity to monitor our impact uh, with our constituents. Um, you know, these uh, uh, systems can be used for case management, uh, you know, museum visitation counts, uh, uh, what, what's happening with the, uh, what are the outcomes uh, we're tracking, the graduates of our educational programs, and feeding those back into a single system that, that relates that information to how those same constituents might be engaging as volunteers, attending events, turning into donors, they themselves uh, advocating on behalf of your organization, and collecting that all in one place means that we can turn around and, and uh, measure that, uh, develop metrics, uh, provide that information and transparency to our stakeholders, such as our board members, our, our uh, donors, uh, the organizations that give us grants. We can leverage that data. So. All right. So what is a CRM roadmap? Okay, so at a high level, a CRM roadmap is an opportunity to articulate your organization's CRM vision. So, uh, well, in the end, the CRM roadmap, and I'll show you in the next slide, the table of contents, it's a really big document, uh, or it can be, with a bunch of different chapters. Um, and it'll, it'll, it'll distill down into a PowerPoint as well. But, at a high level, conceptually, it's an opportunity to articulate your organization's CRM vision. So I just talked about that, and you may uh, be sitting there and go, Keith, I know that. I got it. I know what our CRM vision is. But it's important that everybody in your organization know what that vision is, uh, that it's clearly spelled out, uh, that it's advocated for from the highest levels of management. Um, and so setting down that vision uh, in the CRM roadmap is absolutely key because Throughout an uh, initiative to roll out your CRM vision and all the different pieces that takes in an organization, we need the guidance along the way to remind us, what are we doing? What is this project for? What is my piece in that? What's the ultimate goal? And so we want that CRM vision kind of always uh, at top of mind, at the forefront, so we can keep referring back to that as a touchstone. Um, developing a CRM roadmap is itself a process for collaborating on and socializing the CRM opportunity at your organization. So it isn't uh, a CRM roadmap is not something that you know two or three people go off into a corner and develop and then come back and say, hey, look at folks, we've got one, we've got a roadmap. Now everybody get on board and let's go. No, you as you develop a CRM roadmap, you want to engage a lot of people uh, in that process so that. Um, uh, with two reasons. One is that they, uh, as much as you may uh, have a handle already on what your vision should be, what the opportunities are for an organization, how you should go about it, I guarantee you there are things that in speaking with uh, stakeholders on the front line, you will learn a lot about that will help uh, modify and improve your efforts. At the same time, that process of collaboration brings out, it brings out those positive ideas, it brings out concerns that you can be aware of, it can bring out uh, things that you can start to address uh, right in that CRM roadmap process. And all of that contributes to the socializing of the CRM opportunity, making people understand what that opportunity is, their part in it, and helping them feel comfortable with all of it. And that is part of the change management process that is absolutely key, getting people on board. It also is practically, tactically a plan to get to your CRM vision. Right? So you've got high-level stuff, you've got some change management stuff, and then you've got the practical, tactical details on how to get there. So 
So what's a table of contents look like for a share roadmap? Here we go. Got about a dozen items here. Um, now I will note right away, not every CRM roadmap has all of these pieces. Right? This is a lot to put into a roadmap. Now some organizations end up doing all of these pieces. Uh, they may do them all up front at once. They may do them in pieces. But um, but uh, most organizations are going to pick six or eight or ten of these that are important to them and and work on them. Um, so uh, you know I've, we've highlighted in green the ones that we're going to go over today. I'm going to briefly mention a few of the others. Um, so we'll see our vision. We just talked about that a bit. Constituent engagement journey is where you can do a deep dive into. Um, you know, what are my communications plans with my constituents? I have different stakeholder groups. What kind of what what kind of experience do I want them to have? How is that going to translate into a communications and engagement plan with them over the course of a year? That can get very very detailed. Um, technology and operations assessments. What what technology do I have right now to support those engagement journeys to support that vision? What's working? What's not? Um, what are my business processes? You know, what's efficient? What's not? Where am I duplicating efforts across the organization? Really, what what would that look like ideally? So, kind of building all that together. Uh, user stories and business requirements. What's it like on the on the front lines? Uh, using our systems, engagement with our constituents. Again, what's working? What's not? What we would like to see happen? Solution selection is where you, if you say, well, you know, we we do need some technology in here. Uh, but what are we going to buy? Right, and going through a process based on your business requirements and your assessment to go and get the solutions that you need. Um, so then from there, uh, we dive into some, some of the pieces that we're going to talk about today. And, and those other pieces, uh, you'll find um, you'll find materials uh, in the resources that I mentioned earlier uh, that will help to uh, talk about those things as well. And of course, at the same time, we're happy to take questions about that today. So with that, oh. Why do we why do we do a CRM roadmap? So uh, we're asking we're trying to answer a bunch of questions, uh, and this this always reminds me of uh, when you were taught to write a newspaper article, uh, you know, in elementary school. The who, the why, the what, the when, the where, the how. Um, these are going to be front and center questions that uh, your stakeholders, your staff, your management, your board are all going to have, and we want to be able to answer them. And the CRM roadmap uh, is the document. And the process by which these questions will get answered. So, first and foremost, of course, is the why, and that's going to be the CRM vision. All right. So, articulating that again early is important. Then, what are we doing? What? All right. I'm hearing about this CRM initiative. What the heck is that? You know, what are we? What is it? What does that pro project and process look like? Who's doing what? What am I supposed to be doing? What are you supposed to be doing? You know, when are we doing each of these pieces, and how are we going about all of this? So. At the beginning of a CRO roadmap, you're not going to be able to answer all these things, but the goal is through the process and at the and with the deliverables at the end, you will be able to. So let's talk about the first piece uh, that we'll be covering today, and this is uh, the phased approach uh, to adopting uh, and, and implementing a CRM initiative. And, and we're going to be looking at this from a systems perspective, that down in the uh, at the level of the technology itself. Um, now, uh, I say down, but actually this is your 30,000 foot view, and, and, and over the next couple of sections we're going to see a 30,000 foot view, a 15,000 foot view, a 5,000 foot view. We're going to hone in more and more. Um, but the, the phased adoption is the notion that right now you have, let's just look at your at the current system. This is from a, a national organization, 120 chapters uh, a few years ago, and um, you know they had a lot of different systems. And a, and, and a lot of different constituents in different systems, and some of the times the same constituents in, in, in different systems, and those systems weren't connected, and they were having all sorts of issues with constituents having a positive experience. Um, now, of course, uh, when we map this all out for them, we say, well, what do you want to do? They say, we want to change everything. <laughs> well, that's, that's uh, okay, that's a plan, but we can't do it all at once. And so you have to decide which pieces are you going to change uh, you know, in the first 6, 12, 18 months, what are the pieces you're going to change in your second phase, third phase? And if you have, uh, if you adopt a really strong CRM platform and you really embrace the concept of CRM uh, and best engagement with your constituents, your strategy and approach will not be static. It will mature over time. Uh, and so, uh, 
you'll never run out, really, of phases. Uh, now, your first project were probably going to be to retire systems and strategies and business processes that aren't working for you anymore. But once you get to that spot where, hey, everything is sort of, you know, much more meeting our original goals, you'll see uh, things open up and you'll want to do even more over time. So I'll show you a couple of phases here, but but after that, people don't stop. They 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 tend to go from being a reactive organization, uh, which is what gets them to this first project and, and trying to fix problems and realize some level of vision, to being proactive and seeing more and more opportunities that they can act on. So, so one of the things you'll notice over the next couple of slides is simply there's less of these bubbles. Things get consolidated. So this is their starting point, and in their phase one, they were able to consolidate significantly uh, their online presence, uh, bring uh, some of their legacy CRM systems together into a single platform, make linkages between systems that they didn't have before. And when they make, make when they bring, when we talk about bringing data together, making linkages, what we're also talking about is we are unifying the constituent experience. The constituents themselves are feeling like, oh, this organization is treating me like a whole person. They're, they're putting in on who I am and, and what's important to me about my uh, relationship to the organization. And so while we have a technical aspect, we also have an impact aspect when it comes to your constituents. So this is where these folks ended up in phase one. So I'll go back just briefly. This is the before. This is the after. They got to this point and were able to sort of hang out here for a while and get used to this new environment and get used to it is, all right, get used to the technology, get used to how we internally as an organization operate and relate to each other across departments and such, and also allow their constituents to get used to the new experiences they were having uh, and take that feedback. And then uh, their, for their initial vision, uh, they were then able to further consolidate, bringing together uh, their chapters into their core CRM, their missions and programs database into that core CRM, uh, and you'll see that reflected in the next slide here. So you see there's an ongoing simplification. Now that simplification is from a technology and business perspective, but it's actually allowing for a greater complexity and sophistication in how they engage with the constituents. Because as they bring all this data together and information and strategy and such, um, they are able to leverage that to provide a more personalized uh, experience for their constituents. Because previously, a single constituent might be related to by multiple departments. Their information is spread across multiple databases. And so you had to have these kind of multiple but simplistic communications and engagements with the constituents. Once you bring everything together, then you can hone, uh, uh, craft and hone more sophisticated and personalized uh, communications. Now, the nice thing about this, that you would think, gosh, that's really complicated, but contemporary CRM systems automate uh, that personalization through data mining and business intelligence and segmentation and personalization. Uh, and we see this in the way that we, uh, as consumers, are uh, uh, engaged by commercial organizations. You know, Amazon knows what, what I want to buy before I know what I want to buy. Netflix knows what movie I should watch. Uh, so Facebook is feeding me ads that are because they know what I like. And that kind of personalized experience we can use in the nonprofit sector uh, to support people in, in better engaging in our organization. So that's, that's the... Uh, uh, that's what phasing looks like, and how do you decide uh, the order of phases? So there are key questions to ask. When you look at all those systems that we have and all those constituents, you start to think, okay, what are our best opportunities? Which constituent groups, if we engage with them, uh, if we put just a modicum additional effort, would yield the most impact for our organization? Uh, or where's our primary pain? What's really not working right now that, that bugs us and bothers us and we want to do better there? Um, what change could we affect the most quickly? Where's our shortest course to having some success? That can be really important. Maybe the shortest course both relieves a problem and provides you political capital for the rest of your initiative, right? That's an important thing to think about. Where can we have the greatest impact? Uh, now, you have to balance all of these because sometimes greatest impact is the thing that's going to take the longest, or it's not the best opportunity, or it's not the greatest source of pain. Or, you know, sometimes the shortest course 
uh, doesn't have enough impact. So these are questions that you ask when you start to put together that phasing. Um, one really important thing to keep in mind is that as you develop your first phases, you have to set up a foundation for future success. Now that that foundation can be in the form of emphasizing fundraising, so you have money to support future phases, or uh, establishing political capital and success because you know you want to get a good track record and get people excited about CRM. Um, it may be that you want to engage a particular constituent group because that will uh, drive uh, uh, support for future phases, or maybe it'll uh, influence uh, you know a funder or a granting organization. So these are things you want to keep in mind when you're when you're developing the phases. Um, so I think I think uh, uh, the pieces on the right there I've covered a bit. I will point out adjust for organizational readiness and calendar. And organizational readiness is who's ready to change. This department, the Department A, might be uh, objectively you know the low hanging fruit and the great, uh, you know place of greatest impact and let's Let's go work with them first. But they may be like, yeah, we like our old system. Yes, we complain about it all the time, but we didn't mean we didn't mean to imply we actually want things to change. We like complaining. So okay, we're we're not going to work with you. But as Carmen B over here, they're knocking on the door. They're they're the ones that when they heard there's even this idea of switching systems and strategies, they came over and said, hey, can we be first? Okay, so you need to look at who's prepared to make that change. So that phasing is our 30,000 foot view. Um, then uh, the next piece in the CRM roadmap is actually your platform and system architecture. How are you going to organize your systems uh, ultimately to provide the best uh, technical experience, business process experience, uh, engagement experience for your different you know, internal and external constituencies? And this is at the 15,000 foot view. So I'm going to show you again a couple of diagrams. Um, before and after shots. Uh, so here we have a before. Um, you'll see, you know, if you can't read all these pieces, that's okay. But the general gist is these folks have a lot of different systems. They have a bunch of different websites or web pages. Uh, there are multiple CMS platforms. Uh, this information goes into multiple databases, as, as uh, uh, you know, indicated by the silos here. There's a bunch of you know dotted arrows and lines and things going around here for integration. And, and in a nutshell, when you see this much stuff on a slide, this translates into effort, translates into inefficiency, translates into missed opportunities, it translates into duplicate communication, it translates into a user experience in your organization, a constituent experience out of inside your organization, which is suboptimal. Right, so then uh, the aftershot is when looking at the specific technologies that they will use moving forward. When, what will this uh, map look like at that time? And again, what we're looking for is greater simplicity where that can sur serve the CRM vision. So this is their before, and this is their after. It's a lot fewer cylinders and circles. Um, and it's not simply uh, for the purpose of there being fewer, but also fewer in a way that is uh, much more effective and guided by their strategies. So that's uh, one example of before and after. And we put another one in here. And you can study these when you uh, uh, receive the slide deck. But here's another before, right? Lots of cylinders, lots of boxes, lots of arrows, and an after. Now, I will admit, you know, uh, this after is simpler than the before, but it's not simplistic. There's still a lot going on here. And that's important. We're not attempting in these uh, types of um, architectures to uh, strip out uh, functionality uh, and things that serve our strategies. But we are trying to make intentional choices around what strategies and processes and, and data we're going to keep and how to organize those in a way that will make us uh, most effective in carrying out our vision. So then, uh, and this is the last, I just got a couple more slides here. I'm going to ask Paul to join me. Uh, but uh, implementation plan. So for each of those phases, uh, we have to think about, okay, how are we going to get that phase accomplished? Uh, and that's an implementation plan. This is at the 5,000 foot level. And this, uh, I have to thank Paul for this slide. This is a very uh, simple and high level uh, plan. Uh, and you'll see more uh, in in detail uh, in, in some of our uh, resources, but um, 
a basic plan uh, used in each phase is that you go through discovery process at a deep level, what's the functionality of the systems that you have now and your strategies, et cetera. Okay, how do we plan for uh, moving you to a new environment and moving your operations, moving your people, modifying your strategies. We have to design that environment, we have to build it out, we have to test it, uh, and we have to go live. Um, and this is this type of approach, uh, while sort of implementation 101, uh, you know, there's a lot more detail that you can find, but it, it, you use it in each phase and with each system that you're going and, and strategy that you're going to change. So I wanted to give you that that high level view here. Um, so uh, now we're going to talk about you know change management. So change management is just as a basic definition. As you can see from what I've covered thus far, uh, there is a lot of change when you go through a CRM initiative. And uh, people get nervous about change. They, they get nervous, they get excited, they have realistic expectations, uh, positively and negatively, they have unrealistic expectations. And change management is the uh, process and approach of helping people move from, uh, from their current situation into the future uh, with the most amount of uh, realistic uh, expectation, the most amount of uh, excitement and enthusiasm, and the least amount of worry uh, that we can uh, help them have. Um, and this is really important. This is this is the people portion of the project. Uh, and quite honestly, in the in the 20 years we've been in business, we have come to recognize that this is the most important portion of the project. All those other slides that I've shown you, we could we could make beautiful diagrams, we could come up with great systems, we could have a flawless implementation, but if we don't have people on board to, to adopt those systems, adopt those strategies, and make that change with us, it doesn't matter. So you really have to look at how you're going to support people through change. Um, and we have a paper coming out uh, uh, in the next couple of weeks about uh, managing this type of change in technology projects at enterprise organizations. Um, and with that, I want to welcome Paul to share with us uh, his experience uh, at Feeding America with uh, change and the CRO roadmap. So uh, welcome, Paul. Thank you so much, Keith. I um, uh, have the good fortune of being uh, involved in a wonderful project here at Feeding America and working very closely with the Heller team, both as a strategy partner and as our uh, implementation partner. Um, we've been working with Heller now for well over a year on many of the processes that Keith had mentioned earlier in the presentation. Many of those steps are very familiar to me <laughs> as we've gone through various elements of kind of mapping out our roadmap to get to the place that we are. And where we're at is now starting the design phase with the implementation of uh, the Salesforce NGO product here at Feeding America. Um, what is also significant about what we're doing is that we've actually taken the time early on in the project to build out infrastructure to help support this idea of change and bringing people along with us. Um, we've experienced this before, both at Feeding America and a number of us who are now engaged in this project in other projects we've been in in other organizations that <clears throat> by shortchanging those components that deal with people, change, communications, things like that, um, we really have seen the projects struggle. And so we took the time early on to build out a, a project rigor, as my boss always say, says, to ensure that we are able to move the project along effectively, but also keep our key stakeholders involved in the project from the beginning and moving through there. So um, if we could move to the next slide. So this slide talks about project readiness. Uh, what we did, for those of you who are familiar with kind of traditional project management methodologies, essentially this served as a gate, a phase gate for us right at the beginning of the project. When we looked at elements of the project for the plan and analyze phase and the discovery phase, we realized we had a whole sequence of elements that we went through and we identified that were critical for us to finish 
or be in process on in order for us to be able to make an effective decision to move forward. Um, many of these touched a lot of our key stakeholders here, such as getting commitments on resources and putting mechanisms in place to identify where we'd have lapses in communications. Some of the things that we'll talk about just in a few minutes, such as the building of communications plans and strategies, the building of a governance model, the building of a change control process, were all, all critical in this project readiness assessment that we took on. Um, and and I think that we've mentioned this a couple of times, but key in this process again is how this new process implementation and change are so intertwined, inextricably intertwined in, the, in our ability to be successful. Next slide. Paul, uh, before I do that, we have a question that comes in. And um, okay. uh, first of all, I would, make an, I would, I would note uh, when you that what you're articulating around the project readiness items that you've done, would you say that those were uh, uh, more people focused or technology focused? I think there was a there was a uh, a number that were people focused. There's a lot that's in the project readiness assessment that's related to ensuring that we have the communications vehicles prepared for keeping everyone in the loop on what's going on. We do have, as obviously with any technology project, a, a series of these that are specifically rated to the, are, are uh, associated with the nuts and bolts of implementation of this project, such as having a project plan in place, such as having a project charter in place and such. But, you know, elements such as an articulated communications plan that has a whole sequence of steps and um, change control and such, which are really related to our stakeholders and people oriented are involved there. So And Paul, based on your either your you know, if you think about your past experience with, with large projects or anticipating this project, um, are the technical changes uh, more challenging or getting people to think differently? I think it's both. I think that we have a um, we have technical changes here because of moving from some very antiquated and disparate systems, much like the slides that you showed a little bit earlier, into something that's going to be far more streamlined and effective for us to do our business. Um, but then we also have a large lift related to change, and that organizationally. Um, We've not been through something as complex as the implementation of a philanthropy CRM here at Feeding America. So getting everyone from our board on down through the stakeholders who are related directly to the project team, such as members of the, of the advisory committee who are going to be working with us on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, getting them prepared and understanding the significance of this both for the organization and also for our uh, for their specific job and how things are going to change for their job is is important and is critical for us to be able to be successful with this project. Yeah, I would uh, share our experience. Uh, you know, which which I think aligns. Um, you know, we do dozens of implementations every year, hundreds and hundreds over the course of our uh, of our of our twenty years. And quite frankly, if you look at our project plans. Uh, they don't differ wildly from each other. Um, the the biggest variables, uh, well, you know, I, I won't I won't downplay. Yes, technology can be really challenging, and it, and there's always challenges in a project around the technology. But what is most variable for us in working with one organization to the next is the culture of that organization relative to change. Are they comfortable? Uh, and they, they leap towards change? Are they reticent and they hold back? Most often they're, they're both, uh, sometimes both in the same person. <laughs> and so navigating that is always, for us, at least, uh, if not more difficult, more uh, varied than, than the technology itself. All right, uh, there you are, sir. Next slide. Thank you. <clears throat> this. This slide is not possible to be read, <laughs> so um, it has it's uh, a screen snapshot of an internet site that we we uh, stood up for our inaugural meeting with our stakeholders. A couple of weeks ago, we had our project kickoff, 
where we invited roughly the 50 stakeholders and partners who are going to be involved in this project here at Feeding America to join with us in, in somewhat of a celebration, to recap what we've been through and also to talk about where we're going. And the, our CRM project site is a vehicle that we stood up as a tool to be used for effective communication to the stakeholders. Um, it is a essentially a, like a one-stop shop for people to go to to understand what's going on on a regular basis. There's places on the site for people to see what's happening now, what they can expect, what they should prepare, and then also quick link take them to places where they're is a great deal of detail if they are so interested. But the summary page is essentially an opportunity for you to go there and within 90 seconds get a good snapshot of where we're at in the project. At the top, that um, Chevron diagram actually is interactive. And so we are currently in our design phase. We've just launched the design phase of this project. And that's why that's highlighted in green. And so if you roll over the design phase on the site, it will actually pop up uh, information which will tell you what's going on, what the deliverables are, what to expect, other things like that that are very detailed related to the phase. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the right navigation of that site is allowing people to also drill down and get more information and go there to also get meeting minutes, presentations that have been done, documents that are going to be, are being worked on or, or being delivered. Um, I think what, what was critical about putting this site up was ensuring that we had uh, a mechanism to communicate effectively to our stakeholders in a way that they can digest very quickly. It's one of a number of tools that we are using for that purpose, but it became uh, something that we felt needed to be done, needed to be visually attractive, and needed to be changed on a regular basis. So in the process of standing it up, we also have a process that we put in place for the regular maintenance of that so that we know when information will go out there, when information will be updated, and ensuring that the content stays fresh for our stakeholders. So. Now, I would, I would note about this, Paul. Uh, of course, we put in a CRO roadmap as an as a aspect uh, uh, we should develop a communication plan, and then we develop that communication plan as part of a roadmap. But the content that you have put here also comes out of a roadmap process. You know, another aspect of the general roadmap process, just to look at what you've got specifically highlighted here, um, uh, you said, what is the design phase? Well, that's something that gets to defined in the project planning portion of the CRM roadmap. Who are the committees? And how often will they meet? And what are the point of those meetings uh, and workshops? Well, that gets defined in the project staffing for, uh, and sponsorship aspect of the CRM roadmap. So what you've done here uh, is you've acted on a part of the roadmap, which is put in place a change management communication plan. But you've also, uh, the content was something that you developed during the roadmap process. Um, so the roadmap process helps feed the change management process with content. That's not right. <laughs> that, I'm sorry. That's absolutely right. <laughs> I, I, I was looking. I was looking for the thumbs up, Paul. I I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Keith. That's absolutely right. Um, this next slide, uh, kind of dovetailing on what Keith just said, is, you know, it, we view change management, change control, governance as all part of our, our kind of strategy at, at outreach and communication to the stakeholders here in the organization. Um, the, the diagram that's on the left side of this slide is uh, a diagram that we created just to have a visual representation of the intersection of all of the various committees that we have that are involved in our CRM project, with our executive committee being the one where our executive sponsor, our senior vice president of fundraising, she sits on that committee, along with a couple of key members, our project sponsor, who is John Vega here at Feeding America, and then the various other committees that are intersecting. The point of the visual is really just to talk about and, and to highlight 
how each of these various uh, committees are going to be intersecting. So for each one of these committees, we have a committee structure, we built a committee charter, we have a communications vehicle via a listserv so that the committee members can actually communicate to each other. Um, we have regularly scheduled meetings, we communicate about those meetings using the, the intranet site that we showed a minute ago. Um, so again, seeing how all of this the, you know, the governance structure has, and the various committees in the governance structure have specific roles that they have to um, act on in terms of how they are making decisions about the project in various levels, uh, potentially various budget areas in the project, um, making key decisions about when there's conflict that has arisen between, say, competing forces within the project. Um, or competing issues that have come up within the project. Um, but in addition to that, the real point of having our governance structure and having it in place and having it very functional is to also promote this idea of change because the, the mandate for every one of the committees is to act as a um, an evangelist, if you will, for the project here at Feeding America. So each one of the committee members in looking at the charter had, has read about that, that we expect them to embrace the fact that we are going to be moving from our existing systems to this new system. We understand what the change impact is going to be in the various revenue streams here, and we understand that the it's being driven by uh, we'll talk about it in a little bit, which is our project charter in the sense that we're looking to implement something that's going to uh, change the way business is done for Feeding America and the way we interact with our our constituents. And so it, I, I like using this governance wheel when I talk about change here at Feeding America because it doesn't exist off in a vacuum just to adjudicate issues that come up or make budget decisions. It's really also a key component of our communications strategy uh, in terms of making sure everyone knows what's going on. And along those lines about making decisions, we also built, and this, this is again a diagram that's very hard to see, uh, but it's a, uh, a Visio diagram that just shows how when issues arise, how the various committees can make decisions and where they make decisions and how they intersect that way and how the project sponsor intersects with each of them. So it was really taking all of these pieces and just kind of synthesizing them into a visual that allows people to fairly quickly understand the intersections of the various groups. Paul, this is great and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a moment here to share uh, comments uh, from the questions and share some questions. Um, okay. I'm going to personally note that uh, in listening to this, uh, I'll admit, uh, somewhere along there, Paul, I thought, gosh, there's a lot that you guys had to plan and put in place. And uh, I'm an impatient person. So why could <laughs> we just... Hello? Like this. Or, and, and that takes a certain amount of time and effort, or you can spend at least twice as much time putting out fires later because you haven't informed people ahead of time and you haven't asked the right people to make the right decisions and you haven't figured out what are you going to do when you get new requests in the middle of a project or new priorities come up, a uh, new opportunity. Um, and so laying this groundwork ahead of time, uh, while it seems to uh, you know, take, a, take additional effort, that the value of which may not be clear in advance, those of us who have been there can say, oh yeah, this is really worth it, digging in. Um, now uh, I have I got uh, one one person I uh, gave you a shout out uh, executive sponsorship really really key it's so important to have that executive sponsorship um, now who uh, uh, in in this model uh, who is the project sponsor is that the, a board member or department head staffer who who's the project sponsor. So in our in our case, our project sponsor is the vice president of philanthropy operations here at Feeding America. Um, our executive sponsor is our senior vice president of philanthropy. So she's responsible for all of the revenue streams that feed philanthropy for the organization. Um, and and I, I want to agree with that person who made that comment uh, or about you know the shout out about executive sponsorship. We're very fortunate here that our executive sponsor has truly embraced this and the um, 
the desire that we have to significantly make change here for Feeding America. And she's excellent at at sending that message and telling people about what are what we're trying to do. But more importantly, she's also excellent at ensuring that we don't lose sight of what's important, which is ultimately tying this back to what the mission of this organization is. She's excellent at that and probably the best person I've ever worked for who can always kind of bring us back to square one, which is what our organization is about and how this fits in. And she did that without us prompting her, which I, I love. And uh, you know, wanted want to give a shout out to, to Leah Ray, our senior vice president, about this. Um, it's it's refreshing and it's heartening and it helps us tremendously as the members of the project team because we have that buy-in at that level. That's great. That's great. And that is, you know, that is the role of the of the of the sponsor at the executive level is keep reminding people what's the vision here? Why are we doing this? How does this make our organization more effective? That's that's great. Um, somebody asked. Uh, Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, you know, she expects us to, you know, be thoughtful and rigorous in our efforts, and I and I hope that in what we've, we're showing and in the way we're doing our work helps to foster that in her as well. That she knows that she can she can trust us with, you know, the money that we've been entrusted with to do this project, and that you know we're keeping that aligned with the goals of the organization. So. Yeah. That's the flip side of having an engaged executive sponsors. You're accountable. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> but, the, but, the, but the great part is then you're all in it together, right? And that's how the that's how a CRM vision gets enacted is when everybody or as many people as you can get are all on board and aligned. Um, so we have uh, let's see another person asked: uh, Are the stakeholders uh, uh, who are the key stakeholders in this project? Are they the are they the other uh, uh, member organizations in the, in the food bank network. Um, no, the for this is a a national office uh, philanthropy CRM. So the stakeholders we have serving on the the uh, steering and advisory committees are uh, owners of revenue streams within this organization. So uh, the steering committee are members are, who are staff members who are at a more senior level, so at the vice president level, uh, peers of the project sponsor. And then the advisory committee are essentially my peers, folks who are uh, kind of the tactical folks on the front line of the organization doing fundraising, doing direct marketing, doing digital marketing, um, those folks. And uh, also finance and technology from the organization as well. I'll note, uh, you know, we've seen uh, projects at, uh, you know, national organizations that have uh, members or affiliates or chapters uh, that um, uh, they'll do their phase one will be to uh, improve what's happening at the national office. And so the stakeholders then are those internal revenue stream owners and such or project department heads. Uh, and then with that as a base, uh, those organizations uh, will roll out what has been developed uh, to uh, you know affiliated organizations, in which case in that second phase, the stakeholders are those affiliated organizations. Um, now when you go to do the plan for the first phase, you already need to be talking to the people who will be part of the second phase so that uh, so that their needs are accounted for when you go to do your architecture. So, um, so that uh, I'm going to advance the slide here. We've got uh, just a just a few more in our last several minutes here. Um, but, but the next slide is sample communication plan, and it addresses a question that came up: What are some of the strategies to handle cultural changes? And I think what we're seeing here is, you know, plan ahead, be transparent, involve people, get an executive uh, sponsor on board who's articulated and, and, and can lead the charge around this, and then uh, you know it drills down into into this communication plan as well that that we'll show here. We had um, taken many of the elements of this sample plan uh, that's on the screen at this point and used this and fleshed it out as part of our communications plan and our communications strategy. So uh, defining who the audiences are, defining the frequency, um, defining 
what sort of uh, elements are going to be communicated. So in this case, you know, milestones and how that works. Um, and so our our plan took this information which which Heller provided us and helped build out these concepts into something that was specific for Feeding America with the various constituents that we we're going to be communicating to. Um, so it was really beneficial, uh, this grid, because it helped as we worked through it to just really kind of think about what's important for us and what's going to work for us on this. Um, and the end result was a, a communications plan that everyone signed off on and which is in place now and working because from our first advisory committee meeting and our first project kickoff meeting and in this month our first steering committee meeting we know exactly who's going to get communicated to when and that's really the key that we you know putting the plan in place so that we know what's going to happen next and that it uh, we just execute then when we're in the midst of that because we're already thinking about something else that's ahead of that. So. And this is, again, this is, uh, on the surface, it can look like a pretty sophisticated plan. There's a lot of boxes here. There's a lot of people and meetings and, and things to write up. Um, but my experience is you can either plan ahead and assume that you're going to do this, or you can uh, not plan ahead and get asked a lot of questions by a lot of different people and realize, oh, I have to explain this to that person and this to that person, and you'll end up doing just as much work and even more because you're behind the eight ball already. And if you told them in advance, you know, what's going on, uh, what's going to happen next week with the project and next month, you wouldn't be asking questions about, hey, why did this happen last month and what does that mean? And, and people are already sort of concerned or in a, in a, you know, have their feathers ruffled about things. So it looks like more work, but in fact, it ends up being less. So, Paul, I'm going to ask you here to uh, share Project Charter. So one of the things that we, we built out in this in these initial phases of the project before design was coming charter and coming up essentially with our mission statement, if you will, as to what the goal of this project actually is. And I, I, I want to work back just very quickly from the last sentence, which is we have a very ambitious set of goals to get us uh, to help with food insecurity in this country in 2025. And it was really looking at that and working back that what this CRM is going to do to help facilitate building out our ability to effectively manage our constituents and engage our constituents in a way that helps meet those 2025 goals. Um, again, I mentioned about the engagement from our executive sponsor this way. And she was involved in the discussions about this and, and why this was important to have on paper early on. And again, it becomes something that we can always refer back to when we say, well, what are we, what are we trying to do here? And this is what we're trying to do. Um, it, it makes it easier when you're in the middle of the flames of doing the implementation <laughs> to be able to come back to something pretty straightforward and say, okay, so that's why we're doing this. All right, let's, it's okay, and, and let's just keep going. So. I, I, I love that, Paul, because if we're honest, that CRM vision that we developed in the beginning, it is both to inspire us to do the project. And as we go through the project, it's also to ask that question in the dark times. Why are we doing this again? Mm -hmm. Why am I making my show? Why am I here on the weekend? So, <laughs> so with that, I just want to cover this the last piece here, the business case. So uh, we're often asked, hey, help us develop a business case for this uh, CRM initiative. And today I'm just going to note what the table of contents is for that business case. Um, but this is what gets circulated at the board level and the key stakeholders to, to, to make the case for doing this. And it starts with, again, with that CRM vision. And, and Paul, what you shared there with the project charter, that's exactly uh, a wonderful example of a CRM vision that can inspire people and guide a project. Um, you want to articulate the CRM benefits. Uh, we have other presentations to talk for an hour, an hour and a half, about what are the benefits of a CRM system. You want to articulate those particular ones for your organization. What are the investment and offset? You know, what's it look like financially from a budget perspective? I will note, um, and this is often disappointing people, but you will never break even on your CRM investment. You, you can't think of it as, if I retire my old system and put in a new, I want to be cost neutral. I want to save money. I don't see those things happen in successful projects. The way that uh, things make sense from a budgetary perspective is that because you have new systems and strategies and processes, you are able to expand what you are doing, which either means uh, doing, delivering more services 
for a similar, uh, uh, similar amount of money or raising more money. Uh, but you're, you, something has to grow. Uh, you're not going to get it sort of on the expense side of the ledger. But that growth uh, is you know, aligned with share ambition, and it's exciting, and it's risky. Right? People have to be willing to say, yeah, I believe in this vision, and, and I will take on responsibility and ownership for growing some part of the organization, whether that's the financial side of things or the delivery side of things. Uh, and finally, you want to uh, well articulate your opportunities, but also your risks when you make a business case. So it's, that transparency is present from the start. So um, I want to uh, thank everybody for attending today. Uh, there's a couple last questions that I just want to note. Um, uh, someone asked, uh, does Heller do these CRM roadmaps? Absolutely. This is a key service that we offer to people. But we also do implementation of systems afterwards. That was another question. And uh, for those who will be at uh, NCC next week, uh, we look forward to, or in a couple of weeks, we look forward to seeing you there and at the Salesforce Day of the Day prior. So with that, um, I want to say uh, thank you, Paul. Really appreciate your participation today. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's been great. Great to have you on the webinar and, and have uh, be working with you at the uh, Feeding America. And um, thank you to everyone for attending. And we will be um, sending out an email with uh, where you can find uh, these materials uh, uh, in the next couple of weeks. So thanks, everybody.